castles. One, two, three. Replaced with an interactive and involved style of teaching and learning. I took the textbook and I put it on the floor and I said, look, that's a guide. That's like a map that takes you through history. But what history is really about is it's stories of people. This is not just a game. In other words, all you slobs, that's with a V, not a B, okay? All you slobs sit all the way in the back. We're going to try to make this geographic. That way, if you raise your hand and say, hey, Mr. Wilson, you stink, Mr. Wilson knows where that's coming from. I actually, when I was a sophomore, I had him for world history, and I actually wrote more in his yearbook than I wrote in some of my friends' yearbooks. Thank you for actually making me want to learn about history, because I never, ever thought I'd be the person to do that. My initial reaction or desire as an author was not to be a writer, but to be a historian. And I wanted to, in essence, rewrite textbooks. I wanted students to learn history the way I've just described, uh, emotionally understand the people. Well, what do you know about Benjamin Franklin? And this is why I tell stories. Because if you just read textbooks, if you don't understand the people, what goes on in here, what makes this tick, you don't understand anything. If indeed history education fails, then our entire society, our values, our morals, our convictions die as well. History has often, especially these days, seems to have been slighted in terms of pa being passed over. And yet, if we don't learn from history, we are doomed to repeat the mistakes in our future. Well, yeah, actually, absolutely. In fact, I'm even writing a book about that. I feel so strongly about it. I've written books for kids, now I'm writing books for adults. I'm really on a mission to get kids to realize the power of history, not just for the country, but for themselves, too. Thank you for being here. My name is Alan Kay. Um, before I tell you a little bit about me and a little bit about yourself, I just want to point out one tiny little thing that will be important later on this main screen. Look at the various pictures of George Washington here. And notice how different he looks, especially from this moment at the beginning of the war to that moment, the end of the war. That's only a six-year time period. All right, I'll be talking about that in a little while. All right, but let's start. So let's start with this. Who is this crazy guy in the triangle hat? Not too long ago, uh, Bay News 9 came into my classroom and did this story. Look at that, it's working right away. Morning, everyone. In 
inside East Lake High School. How good are we at playing the past? Alan Kane and his students are getting into character. We knew this was coming. They're discussing the tensions between colonists and Indian tribes in the late 1700s. This is not just a game. Kane's energy and passion is clear, which is why. I'm, I'm not kidding. I'll, I'll meet someone, they find out I'm a history teacher, and they'll say, oh, I hated history in school. And I'm going to take it personally. It drives me crazy because it's, it's just so entertaining and so powerful. It's just one reason he began writing a series of books for kids, all with true history parallels. But as kids got older... Hmm. One frustration that Kay found is that as we became adults and we left the classroom, we often forgot about the history that we learned in there. His recent books are for adults, just recently finishing Neither King Nor Country. No one even knows his name. He's been erased. Detailing a person in our history, perhaps worse than famous traitor Benedict Arnold. Are you the most famous traitor in American history because you turned traitor, or are you a worse traitor where they erase you from history? You'll have to read the book to find out. But no matter which title of his you pick, the overall point is the same. We all need to know our country's history. Why does that matter now in particular? If we first learn not to judge the people who lived before us, that it's easier to then not judge the people who are living with us. And it just kind of just helps you be a better person. Maybe that's the quick answer. It helps you be a better person. And in a country as divided now as it was in the 1700s, being a better people will truly matter. In Benalls County, I'm Aaron Murray. Decide tomorrow. We'll see you then. Have a nice day. Spectre, Bay News 9. Thank you, Aaron. All right, it actually worked the right way. So that's what um, kind of an intro is to what I'm about now. I also like to call myself the crazy t-shirt yeah. guy. And that's actually me at Dunedin High School. And this was when I was in my get kids excited about history mode. And that's when I won most of my awards. But, and this is, trust me, part of the story. You've got to learn to know the storyteller just as much as the story, okay? And then, in my own personal life, some things started to, to intrigue me. And I realized, hey, there's something out there. So I started this, you'll notice this is that over there. I started this new mission, what I'm doing right now, as you heard in the video, is I'm talking with adults now. I even wrote a book when I was um, at Dunedin and I started a fish It's like called I Love History But I Hated It in School. <laughs> and you are proof of it, <laughs> right? So, I want to just keep going, keep bringing these stories, that's a big part of it. But the best award I ever won, not like National this or Prinell's County that, was actually getting to spend a week at Mount Vernon. So you, you got to understand where I'm coming from here. <laughs> Love the internet in many ways. That was the book I used to read when I was a kid. When I was... Uh, I think it was fourth grade, got this Adventures of George Washington book given to me. I cannot tell you how many times. I love George Washington. Absolutely fascinated with the man. Still am. So many, 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 many years later, I won this grant and was given the privilege of being able to spend a week at Mount Vernon. That's me there. And I mean at Mount Vernon. I literally slept at the estate. Um, I would basically, if you walk this way, it's about a three minute walk, there's some homes on the estate that I got to stay in. It wasn't just me, there were other teachers, it didn't matter. I would wake up first thing in the morning, right at the crack of dawn, and I would walk right to George Washington's backyard. How many of you have been to Mount Vernon, by the way? Oh, awesome. Okay, so you can appreciate this. I had the mansion to myself. I would sit right there and write in my journal thinking what George, George Washington sat here. Look out at the Potomac, imagine what he thought as he woke up in the morning, what he thought about the British and everything else. But the best ever, I also want you to appreciate, how do you know where George Washington is buried? As we're gonna learn, George Washington's a pretty important guy, right? Think of other countries on the planet. Like, where did the French bury Napoleon? Right? Where's Napoleon's tomb kind of thing? Ask almost every American, where's George Washington's tomb? How do we celebrate? You know, we've got his 
name. I mean, his face right there on a mountain. So where's he buried? You don't have to worry too long. Right there. <laughs> right there on the uh, grounds of the mansion. It's a little bit of a walk. It's actually in the middle of the woods. you got to know where it is. So they opened the gate for me. Again, this is George Washington. He is right in there. Right in there. Notice there's no gold. There's no ornateness. There's no flags waving anywhere. It's just a tomb. And right there, it says Washington. How do I know? I got to stand right there. I got to stand this close to George Washington. And you know what's on my other side? Martha. That's it. There's nothing else in the tomb. There's no portraits, there's no gold, there's no nothing. It's, uh, it's about this big. That's the whole thing. Wow. They gave me a little flag that I was... You guys don't mind, I'm going to take this off now. Can't you get the idea? They gave me a little flag I was able to... Have as a memento of this what this is flag has been in Washington's tomb. I show my students as often as I can, but wow. Okay? But I want you to realize I'm not the only one obsessed with George Washington. Yeah, of course we name our capital after the guy. Of course there's a state named after the guy, and of course he's on the dollar bill. I once had one of my students ask, how come George gets the one? <laughs> you know? What's Franklin on? What's Grant on? Heck, Hamilton. He's not even a president. Look what he gets. The answer, you know, I thought about that for a while, and I said, yeah, but who do we see the most often every day? How many of us have a one in our pocket? How many of us have a 50 in our pocket? Oh, yeah. I guess that does make some sense. Okay? But you can see this, this is just some of This is a sampling. A sampling. You know, entire mountains named after him. And yes, even an asteroid is named after George Washington. The most common street name? After Main Street, Washington Street. So I'm not the only guy who's obsessed with George Washington. So why? Why are we so obsessed with this guy? Why is he so heroic to us in so many ways? So many books have been written on him. Right? Is it because, man, that guy's brilliant. Man, he's smart. George Washington never had more than what we would call an eighth grade education. Right? I mean, he was smart, just not book smart. And this is yet another testament to George Washington. Imagine if the people who were following you, who listened to you, and gave you respect were Ben Franklin, one of the most important scientists in American history. You know, University of William and Mary graduate Thomas Jefferson. John Adams, graduate of Harvard Law School. These guys are following him, and he's only got an eighth grade education. Okay? And I, by the way, will use this for those of you who want to know the next generation. It's like, I will use this also as an indication, like to my role captains, how do you be a good leader? Do they follow you because you're smart? No. There are a lot more smart people than George Washington, his education was. How about his military brilliance? Was he a military genius? Very good, sir. No, he wasn't. Okay, need I remind you, his most <laughs> famous victory was attacking a bunch of drunk Germans on Christmas night. Okay? In fact, some of his greatest battles were total disasters. I'm curious, those of you who are nodding heads, if you know who actually was the greatest military mind of the age. I'll tell you later. How about his bravery? All right, we've got to give him that. I'm going to tell you the story of what he did during the French and Indian War, which, by the way, some people say he caused. Okay? Yes, he absolutely was brave. But is that all it was? Was it? Was it because he was the first one? All right, let's put him on the dollar bill, name the capital, name the state, all those other things, you know, because he was the first. Is that all? This book, strangely enough, is not up here. I don't know whether it's gotten, it's not your fault, I think it's gotten out of print, but for those of you who, who've seen the Hamilton uh, musical, wow, a lot of that research came from this. And basically, 
everything that we teach about George Washington, probably if you're 60 years old or younger, if you learned about George Washington, it was based on this man's biography. James Thomas Fletcher, you'll notice, won the National Book Award for his book on Washington. Look at the title. Why? Why was George Washington indispensable? He certainly was the first, the famous quote, first in war, first in peace, and first in the hearts of our countrymen. But why? It started when he was a kid. I'm going to cast this book around in just a second. It's called The Rules of Civility. This is not something George Washington wrote, but it's something that he copied over and over and over again. There are 110 rules. I just gave you a few of them. The rules of behavior, how you treat other people. He wrote these over and over and over again because he had an intense desire to be a good person. So here we go. We'll just pass it on. Feel free. Let's just let this go around the room. Kind of skim through it. Some of them were really odd. I didn't put any odd ones up here, except uh, I thought this one was kind of fun. Number 94. If you soak bread in the sauce, let it be no more than what you put in your mouth at a time. <laughs> a lot of you will look at these and say, oh, my mom taught me this one about behavior. You know, like in essence, it's not polite to point. But as you kind of just look them over, you can see it's all about character. It's about humility. It's about not putting your needs in front of someone else's needs. And he lived this. This was the kind of man that he tried to be. He wasn't always. Like, for example, I don't know if you know, he had one of the worst potty mouths ever. Boy, could he swear. Okay. But he tried his best to be a good person. And it started as early as his teenage years. This is George Washington as a teenager. Fact. If you look carefully, I don't know if you can tell, but that's not a painting. This is my picture of a 3D model of George Washington. How obsessed are we of George Washington? We have studied him more than anybody in history. The geographer, uh, the National Discovery Channel, Mount Vernon and others spent millions of dollars studying everything they know of George Washington, every single bust that was ever made, every painting of him, and they computerized a perfect model. That is what he looked like when he was 17. And they've got his entire life figured out. You go to Mount Vernon, and you go to the museum. It's exactly what it looked like. So not bad. It's a pretty good looking guy. A surveyor, by the way, for those of you who want to know a little bit more about him who, ready for this character, was in love with his best friend's wife. Again, fact. Her name, anybody? Sally Fairfax. He had a thing for her. Now, I don't like liking somebody this much. I have been accused of fangirling over George Washington, right? <laughs> I mean, yes, we all like to have role models and heroes, but we want to, you know, make sure if we admire someone, they deserve the admiration. So I am telling you, honestly, I have studied George Washington more than anybody I've ever studied. Like I spent, like I said, a week at Mount Vernon. I can't find any dirt on him. I mean, everybody wants to know, did George have a relationship with Sally? I mean, we know what Alexander Hamilton did to his wife, some of you again have seen the musical, we know what Thomas Jefferson did with one of his slaves. But we can't find anything on George. Anything. There's no evidence whatsoever. So what did he do? He ran away. What he decided to do as a young man, now it's not the only reason, he also had ambition, so there's a fault. He didn't want the temptation. He knew he was in love with his best friend's wife. And so he said, I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to join the military and go off and end up starting the French and Indian War, which is what he actually did. So there's a statement on character. How about his bravery? Well, again, appreciate you're going to learn even more about George Washington than 
you already know. But you already know, this guy was kind of important. He was the indispensable man. In his first battle, when it's the colonists, and I'm talking colonial French and Indian War, not the Revolution, and the British, and George Washington is fighting alongside the British, the commander gets killed. It's an ambush. There's Indians everywhere. George Washington jumps onto his horse, starts giving commands. Two horses get shot out from under him. Finally, it's over. So this is the first time anyone's like, wow, that guy's brave. It's finally over, and he does what all soldiers do after a big battle. I get hit, your adrenaline's going, you don't notice. Hole in his hat. Another one in his lapel, right there. Another one in the other lapel. A millimeter from his crotch. Four bullets. If any one of those four bullets had been one inch close to him, George Washington would have died that day. And everything we know, the entire existence of the United States of America would have never happened. So, you can look at it another way. You can look at what George Washington wasn't. Hopefully you've heard of Napoleon. Greatest conqueror, perhaps, in European history. Why does he look so miserable? Because this is after Waterloo. Why did you fail Napoleon? You wanted me to be another Washington. King George III thought Washington was crazy for finishing his presidency and just Walking away. And then there's my favorite story. I'll do this one quick. The American Revolution is militarily over. I'll get into this in a little more detail in a few minutes. Does anybody know what the last battle of the American Revolution was? Very good. Someone has yelled it out, Yorktown. Right? You guys, don't you participate, okay? I know all my students cheating in on this one. Yorktown. Yorktown was in 1781. The surrender, the official end of the war, wasn't until 1783. That's a long time in between last battle and end of the war, two years. We'll talk about why two years in a little while. So, this is how George Washington looks now that the war is over. Really kind of burn that into your brain. And he and his entire army were camped in New York, in the town of Newburgh. Why were they there? As you're going to see. Because the British hadn't left yet. The British were still in New York City, saying, hey, we ain't leaving until the war's over. So he can't go home. I mean, does anybody feel comfortable with a British army sitting in New York City? No, don't go home, George. What if they decide to leave? This goes on for two years. George Washington's men, let me point back. George Washington's men are getting really, really, really upset with this. The damn Congress! We haven't got our pensions. What's going on? Eventually, they decide to have a meeting. Kind of like this one. <laughs> they don't invite the general. What do they talk about in this meeting? We need to march on Washington. Well, not Washington, sorry. <laughs> Slate Martin Luther King slip up there. We need to march on Philadelphia, of course, as the capital. Why? We need to we need to take over. In other words, they were planning a military coup. And if you know anything at all about how dangerous military coups are, you may remember that that's how Napoleon got started. This is before we've become a democracy. We've beaten the British, but we're not yet a democracy, and all of our officers are saying. We need to march on the Capitol and take over. This Congress is democracy just ain't working. And then, all of a sudden, from a back door, in walks the general. This is 100% documented. We know this story because everybody talked about it. He walks into the room, and of course, an entire hush was. 
You know, of course, they're terrified. What's he going to do to us? Washington walks up to the man in charge and says, May I speak, sir? Uh, 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 of course, General. Of course. Nobody knows what Washington said next. Nobody. Nobody. But everybody knows what he did. He reaches into his lapel. And he pulls out, as you can see in the picture, a set of glasses. And he's got a paper in front of him. And before he puts on his glasses, he does this. Pardon me. I've grown old in the service of my country. And he puts on the glasses and says something. Nobody knows what he said. Why? Because they were all too busy bawling. In that simple gesture, George Washington reminded them of everything they had been fighting for. Valley Forge, crossing the Delaware, Yorktown, all of it. Of everything that he meant to them. In that simple gesture of putting on glasses, the coup fell apart. You know, you've probably been in situations like this where you see a lot of people crying. This kind of It's just like that. Crying, people just kind of walk out of the room. We'll never speak of this again. And it never was until nowadays. So it is a fact if you say George Washington saved the country, prevented a military coup simply by putting on a pair of glasses. Yeah. He hasn't even become president yet. Okay. How about this guy? Right? I mean, if we want to talk military, Benedict Arnold, right? Most famous trade in American history. By the way, I saw you nodding earlier, sir, about his military brilliance. Are you aware of Benedict Arnold's military brilliance? Yes. If you ask people who know the American Revolution, know the battles, and you say, what was the most important battle, most important victory of the American Revolution other than the last one, Yorktown? It would be Saratoga in New York in which the British were prevented from cutting off all of New England and capturing the Hudson River. And who did that? Benedict Arnold. General Arnold was a brilliant military tactician. Why did he turn traitor then, if he was so smart? Because guess who everybody followed? Washington. Why are they all following Washington? I'm the brilliant one. All he did was some mess in Long Island. <laughs> he became uh, jealous, envious. In other words, Arnold didn't have the character, didn't understand what leadership was all about. And that's why he turned traitor. He wanted the recognition. All right, enough is enough. I'm going to the other side. So it doesn't just speak all the story of Ben McDonald. It tells you the character of George Washington. So who was his greatest enemy then? If it wasn't Benedict Arnold, I mean, the man who went to the other side and said, all right, Fritz, what you need, I'll help you out. Who was the greatest enemy? I don't know, or at least I didn't know. Up until this point, everything that I've told you, I've known for more than a decade. I've learned a lot of it, taught my students it. And then, then I started doing some family history. How many of you do genealogy? <coughs> You're interested in your family history. Okay, a few of you. Um, I want to remind all of you who are grandparents to be very careful of what you tell your grandchildren. You see, when I was, oh, I don't know, nine, ten years old, when I first started loving history, whatever, my grandmother says to me, Alan, did you know we're related to John Adams? That was all I needed to start doing genealogy. Really, really, yeah, John Adams? Wow, that's so cool. And then went on about a 30 year mission trying to find out how am I related to John Adams? Uh, let me just cut to the chase. I'm not! It's the wrong John Adams! <laughs> but meanwhile, while I'm doing all of this, I find this. I find that. That's kind of odd. I find this. I run into my wife's office, she has an office at home. Honey, you won't believe what I just found out. 
few weeks later, honey, we'll believe what I just found out. This goes on for a few months, a few years, and finally I say, honey, I gotta write a book, oh my god! This is unbelievable. Now, proof of my point, A, I did not know this after I'd won all those awards. So I want to point out, I'm a nationally award-winning teacher, Daughters of the American Revolution, national award-winning teacher. I'm not saying that to you to impress you. I'm saying that to you that I didn't know the story that I'm about to tell you. I have done this discussion with AP American history teachers, high school history teachers who are at the highest level. They don't know the story. Nobody knows the story. What story? Who was erased from history? Wow. Well, let's start. If you don't mind, a little bit of story time. Let me read you just a few pages from the introduction of my book, or rather the prologue. This scene starts with George Washington being in New York. He's just recently gotten the British to leave Boston, and now it's the Battle of New York is on its way. Okay. So here we go. General George Washington could not believe his eyes. Everywhere he looked, men were staring at the British ships instead of manning their posts. It was as if the majesty and power of the British Navy had so taken them by surprise that they were hypnotized beyond reason. His heart filled with rage at his men, but also at the British. How could they hope to defeat an enemy that inspired such fear and awe in its subjects? The sight of a British warship or redcoat seemed to turn the colonists into children. Yet they were children. In so many ways, the men under his command were infants in comparison with the well-trained fighting force on board those ships. All around Washington were shopkeepers, farmers, merchants, men without any uniforms, without any training. His own Colonel Knox, the savior of Boston and Washington's trusted friend, had been a bookseller before the Battle of Lexington. To even call it an army was an exaggeration. Colonists from New England, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and as far south as Virginia had cultures as different from each other as the clothes they wore. New Englanders wore almost no uniforms except for the few who had sewn together pieces from old colonial wars they or their father had fought in. Virginians had full-fledged British-style blue uniforms and looked down in shock as even free black men from New England joined the ranks. They were more like separate countries than a united army. And as Washington watched the skies fill with smoke, as he felt the gunpowder in the air sting his lungs and listened to the screams and cries coming from the citizens of New York City who were being bombarded by the British gunships, the doubts started to take hold. Boston had been a simple story. The British were surrounded there. Washington's men could park their stolen cannon on Dorchester Heights and bombard not only the British Army in the city, but the British ships in the harbor as well. New York was an entirely different situation. Where Boston had been a smaller city, like an island stuck in the middle of a harbor, New York was already one of the largest cities in North America, second only to Philadelphia. Two rivers, a bay, the Jersey Shore, Staten Island, Long Island, Brooklyn, and even the heights of Harlem would all have to be fortified and protected. The British Navy, with their command of the sea, could land their forces wherever they wanted and attack at will. Washington's small army of 15,000 men, already decimated by smallpox, was split up all over the area. On June 29, 1776, the first British ships began to arrive. A once empty harbor suddenly filled with ship after ship after ship. Within hours, there were more than 30 ships, and within days, over 100. And with every ship having two to four wooden masts sticking up high into the air, it seemed as if an entire forest had been planted in the waters surrounding New York. Washington heard one of his men describe as if all of London was afloat in the harbor. It was the greatest spectacle of power any of them had ever seen. From his relative safety on the shores of the Hudson River, looking south to the bay, Washington was overcome with dread as he saw what the victory at Boston had truly accomplished. All he had managed to do was arouse the sleeping giant. No British ships had been destroyed in Boston. No British army had surrendered. The British may have left Boston with their tails between their legs, but they were returning with a vengeful desire to put the unruly colonists in their place, and they had the power to do it. 
The British Navy was the largest navy in the world. The British Army was the best trained fighting force in the Americas. The British King, George III, had more than enough money to hire more men and material than Washington could ever hope to match. It was the largest fighting force ever assembled in North America, and it looked like all of it would be used against Washington and his army of shopkeepers and farmers. More than a week had gone by, and still the ships did not approach Washington's position, despite their overwhelming superior numbers. Instead, they just continued, day after day, to ominously add to their forces and land their troops safely on the shores of Staten Island. Yet another loyalist stronghold, the island welcomed the troops with cheers, looking forward to the day when the Patriot rabble and the rebel mobs would disappear and order would be brought back to New York. These loyalists, Washington had come to realize, were a real threat. Only days ago, a conspiracy to assassinate the general himself was uncovered. Not only were soldiers in his own service involved, but the mayor of New York City was suspect. It was getting to the point where Washington could not trust anything or anyone. And so, finally today, two weeks after the British ships had appeared in the harbor, they made their first move. Despite their power, the British still moved slowly. The enormous gunships Phoenix and the Rose, accompanied by only three support vessels, sailed effortlessly up the river past Hamilton's position and towards Washington. The rest of the fleet remained behind. Even with this small force, Washington realized in anger, the British treated this army like gnats to be ignored or swatted away, boldly daring him to stop them. After hours of bombardment by all of the guns at Washington's command, the ships calmly, obnoxiously, moved on past the general and further up the river to begin Washington knew not what, and he was helpless to stop them. Perhaps, Washington wondered, they will take the forts Montgomery. Those were not even being built yet. If the British could cut off the Hudson River, they could cut off New England and continue cutting the colonies in half until they were no more. Perhaps they would land a force and unite with the army with the many loyalists in the Hudson River Valley. Loyalists own more than two-thirds of the property in New York, were represented at all levels of society, and in many places in the colony were even the majority. Perhaps, he realized with more dread, they were bringing arms to those same loyalists and creating another homegrown army even more powerful than his own. As Washington quickly called for a messenger, he thought to himself, how could they ever win this war if they were not only fighting the mightiest empire on earth, they were also fighting each other? What very, very, very few Americans realize about our revolution is that it was also a civil war. In every way, it was a civil war. And these loyalists were a true threat to Washington and his men. I'll show you how many of them were in just a minute. So, for example, one of the ways that all of the colonies tried to stop this is they forced every colonist to take a loyalty oath to the new colony. The most vindictive, I guess is the best word for it, or the strongest one, was the one in Connecticut. You had to say to the Connecticut General Assembly or whichever committee was given power that you are loyal to the state of Connecticut. You're loyal to the newfound uh, Democratic government in Philadelphia. You are not going to sell any weapons to the British. You're not going to sell them food. You're not going to fix their horses' horseshoes if they come to you for help. And they enforced it. This gave the colonial governments the authority to go to your house to force you to sign your loyalty to the new government. If you did not, they could take your home away. They could put you in prison. Many times they would just burn your house down, and other times they would tower and feather you. Now, a lot of times when you hear of tower and feathering, perhaps some of us think of it as, you know, kind of funny, the guy's a giant chicken man. But if you've ever seen, anyone ever seen the John Adams miniseries? That's got a really wonderful, intense scene of tiring and feathering and how truly horrific it was. Many people were tired of feathering died from their wounds. Or they shook them upon the rail, a piece of wood covered with spikes and nails and things like that. So if you did not swear your loyalty to the new government, you were in big trouble. And so one of the statements in my book, one of my characters who has been confronted with 
signing the Test Act of Connecticut, is not a loyalist per se. He simply wants to take care of his family. He doesn't want to go fight in the war, but he doesn't want to take the other side either. And when they come to him, you've got to sign this, you've got to commit it. He says to them, are you not simply replacing the tyranny of a king with the tyranny of the mob? It is so ironic. I mean, the American Revolution, that's who we are. I like to say we're the self-determination nation. We are the country, it's freedom! And how ironic is it that in our very birth, or even pre-birth, if you want to call it that, that the only way to win our ultimate struggle was to deny that freedom to other people. And of course we all realize this was a war. We all realize the necessity, there's entire books and series on the spies, maybe some of you have seen Turn, for example. It's okay. But that's one of the biggest areas, and it leads to wonderful, wonderful discussions in our classes, debating, were we right to do this? Not right, do we have to do it? What can you, what is right to do in a war? What's not right to do in a war? Wonderful, wonderful discussions. So these loyalists are a real, real serious threat. Take a look at what Alexander Hamilton noticed, okay? He did some ransom numbers, and he said that there were at least 50,000 loyalists. Did you hear how big Washington's army was earlier? Right? That in New York City alone, 19,000 of them had joined the British Army. Most American farmers wanted to sell their goods to the British. I think we all can understand why. If I'm a farmer, I want to get money for my food. The British give you gold and silver. Washington's government gives you paper money, which is only good with other people who are also rebels. So if you were a farmer, even if you had sympathy for the rebels and George Washington and his friends, you were like, I gotta feed my family. Your paper's worthless to me. So I'm gonna sell the British because they give me gold and silver. And those of you who are real military historians may remember, uh, was it Robert E. Lee who said an army wins on his stomach? How important food is. So we're really in trouble. And then if you just kind of generalize it, Hamilton has said at least 20% of Americans were actively loyalists and another 50 were neutral. George and his friends, the rebels, they were in the minority. In the minority. Okay? So, the American Revolution, time to the revolution. It's an intense war. Uh, most of us who are just, you know, general no um, knowledge of American history, we know about York, uh, about the Delaware. We know maybe about Yorktown. But I don't think any of us realize how how intense of a struggle it was. Like you heard in the book earlier, this is the only book over here, by the way. But these, I just put these together from the Vegan Public Library, or rather, they were put together for me. Thank you so much, Elena. Feel free to check these out. This particular book right here, just recently came out, I think it was just a year or two ago at the most, is about the mayor of New York City and other people who tried to murder George Washington. Right? So he's got loyalists trying to kill him. For those who are familiar with Mel Gibson Braveheart playing the Patriot, that's what I like to kind of call him, wonderful movie, over the top, but what happens in that movie is realistic. The guerrilla warfare, the kind of reprisals the British took upon colonists who took the other side. We already know that when Washington crossed the Delaware, of course that was Christmas night, but does anybody know why he crossed the Delaware? Why it was such a... I mean, this is a big risk. You know, you got this icy river. He crossed the Delaware, well, obviously around Christmas time, right? So it's the end of 1776. Why is Washington so desperate to cross the Delaware? Because guess what happens in 1777? Everybody's enlistments run out. See, when you enlist, of course, you have to be X amount of time, and if you run away from the military, well, you're a deserter, they can show you. But, once your enlistment is up, which was the end of 76, you could go home. So, if it's November of 1776, you're saying, we haven't won a darn thing. British are going to nail us, i gotta go. I got to go take care of the farm. I'm out of here. So, Washington is absolutely just, we need a victory, we need a victory, the guys are all going to leave, we're going to get a victory. What can we do? Well, there's some Hessians, some Germans, 
partying it up over there in Trenton. Let's go get them. You notice my t-shirt, by the way. I was not actually part of Judge Washington's Roaring Crew, but I did get this t-shirt in Trenton. We already know about Benedict Arnold. So that, of course, is going. This is a major military blow. And last but not least, I think a lot of us have heard of Valley Forge. Remember, or kind of put two and two together now, one of the reasons why Valley Forge was so bad is no one wanted to give these guys anything. The army is starving right there, just outside of Philadelphia. Why don't you farmers feed them? Because I ain't getting anything for it. So the revolution was in no way a guarantee, right? And if you know anything at all about why we won, thank you, France. Thank you, Ben. Benjamin Franklin. Wow. Without him, we don't win. What's he doing? He's been in Paris for years now, trying to get the French to help us. Now, some of you would say, why does it take so long? If you know anything at all about French history, you know they had a king, too. So just imagine if you're going to some king. Hey, your majesty, uh, we'd like your help getting rid of another king. <laughs> right? And that king's like, ah, oh, that's a bad precedent to set. <laughs> so it took him a while to convince the French, hey, all right, we'll go and we'll help you out. If you know anything at all about the Battle of Yorktown, which took place in Virginia, it's only because the French Navy blocked the British retreat and the French Army helping. Basically, we owe the French an awful lot for our freedom. But that's why we won. Okay. Thank you, Ben. And then, two years later, Washington finally, after that, remember the story with the glasses, Finally, after that's over, November 25th, by the way, they still celebrate this in New York City. It's called Evacuation Day, when the last British troops finally left. Where did they go? We'll find out. Finally, it's over. But again, two years, it's kind of weird. All right. What I love about teaching these stories is so many parallels that we can look at. For example, a lot of us remember the Syrian refugee crisis. And what should we do when, when people from another country are running away? Should we help them out? Is there any historical precedent? Well, yeah, if you've been paying attention, you'll notice the British were pretty darn powerful. They were the superpower. And now, all of these people who remain loyal are leaving. What should the King of England tell these loyalists? We don't ever look at this painting, my fellow Americans. You know who does? The British. This is finally some British perspective. In England, this is what they look at. In England, the king, his royal or her royal Britannica, welcomes the losers of the revolution. Come, let me protect you. And you can see all kinds of losers. You can see the rich. You can see the slaves, the poor. You can see Indians, like the Iroquois, who took the side of the British. And all of these people who the British wanted to welcome. You know... The losers. Give me a second. What should we do with the people who took the wrong side? This was a civil war, right? Got a lot of them. Alexander Hamilton said, the world has its eye upon America. It remains for us to justify the revolution by its fruits. Meaning, what better example of freedom democracy by letting the loyalists live amongst us now. You know what? They took the wrong side. They lost. We're going to show what America means, what a democracy means, and they can stay. Freedom of speech. Freedom to disagree. This is what Hamilton believed. Right? The ultimate right to disagree. Take the other side. That ain't what happened. Because Franklin... Never. No. 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 Look what Franklin thought of the Loyalists. The name Loyalist was improperly assumed by these people. Royalists, they may perhaps be called. The true Loyalists were the people of America. Us! Against whom they acted. No people were ever known more truly loyal and universally so to their sovereigns. We, Ben Franklin, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, we're the loyalists, loyal to the idea of England, loyal to the idea of the Magna Carta. Those people are royalists. Sounds pretty mad, doesn't it? 
Why did it take two years? They surrender in 1781. Two years later, they leave because Ben Franklin was still in Paris. And he was insistent in the treaty. This is the treaty that ends the American Revolution. He insisted that the Loyalists got nothing. Nothing. Now, of course, we can realize what the King of England is saying. Think of how bad you look as a king if these people who remain loyal to you get nothing for it. Before you know it, everybody's rebelling against England. So the King of England is like, no, these, I need to protect these people. You've got to give the loyalists something. And Franklin's like, no, no, nothing, nothing, nothing. And he finally got his way. They got nothing. Everything was taken from them, everything. If they wanted to go home to their old neighborhoods, forget it, man. Their neighbors were taking their houses. The government's just said, okay, go ahead, take their stuff. We don't care. And Franklin made sure this was the case. Why? Why was he so passionate about this? That we almost had a coup because we were waiting for Franklin to get his two years. What's going on here? Well, what do you know about Benjamin Franklin? And this is why I tell stories. Because if you just read textbooks, if you don't understand the people, what goes on in here, what makes this tick, you don't understand anything. I mean, a lot of you probably know, oh yeah, bifocal guy. All right? Some of you may know that. Some of you may know the Franklin stove, at least up north, where you need stoves to keep you warm. I turned the air conditioner on today, my gosh. Some of you Floridians may even say, wait, those are swim fins? Yeah, he invented swim fins. But everybody here, of course, knows that, oh yeah, that's the lightning guy. <laughs> that's the key guy. This is the beautiful painting of Benjamin Franklin like some god at the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia. This is the big mural. This is actually from their website, too. Franklin reaching up into the sky. And I will never, ever, ever take away anything from the brilliant mind of Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> This is the other more common painting of Franklin, calmly flying the kite. Because I'm sorry, they don't, we don't call him the lightning guy, we call him the kite guy, right? And Franklin is second only to Washington, by the way, in number of things named after him. I always see that Franklin plumber guy going by his wheel all the time, and I get a little giggle out of that. This is how I learned my history. I'm guessing this is how you learned your history. This is what I've always seen. But it's not the truth. This is not what happened. Even though it's what we've all been taught. And again, this is what got me. Oh my God! It's a lie! <laughs> so, do you know anything about Benjamin Franklin's family? Did you know we had a daughter he absolutely adored, Sarah, who's buried along with him in Philadelphia. Again, he's Philadelphia's favorite son. A Bostonian, I should point out. Yeah, I parked my car in Harvard Yard. Probably figured that out by now. But he left Boston and never came back. Philadelphia's favorite son had a young son who died at the age of four, and he also had his son, William. Oh, I get it now. No, it's not what you think. He loved William. See, this has only recently come out. I was able to find this on the internet. Over the last 10 years, this story is finally coming out. That Franklin was not alone when he was doing the kite. Now, so what's the big deal? His son, he absolutely adored him. He did everything with his son. He got his son his first job. He got his son to pass the bar, the two of them. Think about this for those of you who have children. You go off to another country, England. You spend years with your son. You help him pass the bar exam. And then the two of you, because it's just the two of you, you're traveling in England, touring around. And then the two of you come back home, and you get your son his first job. And you continue to work together. And he believes everything that you believe about the wonder of 
being a British colonist. And how great it was. You know, you know, like that. Right? They were like that. The most important, most famous experiment you've ever done, my son William's right there with me. The two of us, together, exploring the heavens. And then, and then there's taxation of representation. Franklin, by all accounts, was what we would call a reluctant rebel. He did not really want this. But as time went on, and time went on, he finally decided, in many ways like George Washington, you know what, we just, we got to rebel. Watch what happens. Left side, father. Right side, son. I don't know how many of you are aware of this, but it was Ben Franklin himself who gave Thomas Jefferson the most famous homework assignment in history. Hey, Tom, we need you to write a reason why we should declare our independence. That's John Adams next to him. While this was going on, the job that Ben got his son was royal governor of New Jersey. This is a plaque. It's in New Jersey. It's one of the few places where you can find evidence of the son. And his son was proud of doing his job. He was a proud governor. He felt it was his duty to continue this relationship between the king and colonists. And he was determined to do a good job, to make his dad proud. I'm going to do my job the right way, the way a British dog's supposed to do it. And as his father is turning rebel, the son is going in the exact opposite direction. Not only was William Franklin... <coughs> a royal governor, he was also the last royal governor to give up. And he didn't give up. He was thrown in prison. Hey man, I'm sorry, we don't trust you. And you're still being a governor? This is during the one out by 1776. They threw him in prison. While he's in prison, his father's becoming a rebel. While he's in prison, his wife dies of loneliness. He's a bitter, 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 angry man. He gets out of prison, and he is determined that he made the right choice. Staying loyal to the king. I mean, these rebels are tiring and feathering you if you disagree. I will be on the right side of history. And he forms this board of associated loyalists. He starts recruiting loyalists all over New York to win the war, because the loyalists can make the difference. There are more loyalists than there are rebels, and if we had weapons, the way George's guys had weapons, they don't have a chance. Okay, so you know how it all plays out. He goes to Paris, gets the French up, they win. <clears throat> what happened to him? He went to London. An incredible parallel. He's going off to Paris, representing the rebels, He's going off to London representing the Loyalists. That was his job. His job was to make sure all those loyal people had a safe place to go after the war was over. Father and son, who were now no longer talking to one another. Now, Benjamin is disowning his son. He's asking his son to pay for everything he gave him money for. You know, like if you paid for your son's college, how angry would you be at your son if you said years later, Son, you're going to pay for your college now. All that money I put for your college, you're going to pay it. That's what Ben did to William. He was angry. That's not my phone, is it? Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, that's fine. Why was Benjamin Franklin so insistent about not giving the loyalists anything? Because he was hurt more than any father could ever be hurt. You know what Benjamin Franklin wrote to his son? <clears throat> You staying loyal and doing what you did. Do you know what, son? The first person to have been hung would have been me. You think I'm going to give the loyalists anything? You really think the loyalists are going to get anything after what he did to me? After everything we were together? Oh, no. No. That's why it took two years. Two years. William Franklin. What happened to him? Goes off to London. A man who, by the way, 
also wanted George Washington dead? What happened to this guy who, if he had his way, we never would have won our revolution? Stabbed his father in the back, metaphorically. What happened to him? Well, I think we all know. We ain't going to talk about you anymore. We're going to erase you from history. You see, we've got... Hold on, hold on. This just advanced on me. Oh, my batteries are dying. Oh, that's sad. Oh, wait, there it went. There we go. We've got a great story. We do. We got one of the best in the world. You know, we, we put our heroes on a mountain, you know, like Olympus. Right? And, and we, we even even Arnold fits in great. He's that great traitor who we you know, well, you're a Benedict Arnold, we still say that kind of thing, right? We celebrate it, we got paintings of George Washington. Where does William Franklin fit into this story? We all can see it's it's, it's it's not that simple. And the best way to punish I mean, does anybody really want to talk about Benjamin's pain? So, I mean, Ben Franklin, you know, the old bifocal, key type guy. So we erase him. For about 200 years. I didn't learn about him. You didn't learn about him. We're only now starting to learn about him. What happened to these guys? Greatest modern day refugee crisis. Hey, <laughs> that's what happened home. Most of them went to Canada. You go to especially New Brunswick, which was created just for the loyalists. It's amazing. We've got a daughters of the American Revolution. They got daughters of the loyalists, sons of the loyalists. Actually, you know where a lot of them went? About let's do my math here. About 200 miles northeast, St. Augustine. A lot of them took off and went to St. Augustine because St. Augustine, Florida, was owned by the British at the time. Oh, well, let's go there. Others went all the way to Australia. Some of you had money, like William, went to England. And then the British quickly forgot about a revolution. And they went to India and all sorts of kind of stuff. And that's a story for another day. But what about these guys? As a father myself, kind of being able to relate to the story, and those of you, this isn't a father-son, they can be a mother-daughter thing as well. Did they ever talk again? I don't know if you have, and this is, this is again, the real guy, I don't know if maybe you've got some estranged relative that you had some massive fight with, and you ever wonder, are we ever going to hug? Will we ever make up before we go to our graves? I mean, it doesn't get much uglier than that. When you think about, wow, did they ever talk again? Did they ever meet again? <clears throat> Near the end of his life, William Franklin is in London. Sorry, ne well, he is in London. Yeah. Benjamin Franklin, near the end of his life, is in Paris. William's in London. And Ben is finally going home. Well, if you're leaving Paris and going to America, it's not that hard to swing by England on your way. They did meet. They met. They didn't hug. <laughs> what was said? No one knows. But I do have my theories. And that's what my book is about. In my book, you can see what finally happens. I'm not, this is not a sales pitch. Mm -hmm. okay? yeah. if, I, if I really cared about all this, I would not be teaching for 25, 30, <laughs> however long I've been teaching for. But I don't want, just in case you get my book, I don't want to give it completely away. I have a theory as to, you know, what they would have said. I kind of put myself in Ben's shoes. How did he feel? Did he forgive his son? You could have your own theories. But that's pretty much how the story ends. That's what happened between Ben and, to me, the greatest enemy of George Washington was the loyalist, William Franklin, the greatest of them all. And as we like to say in all stories, the end. No. <laughs> <laughs>